I'd like to go back to the time when you thought that you might never play a musical instrument again. Mm. And somehow Benjamin Britten came into your life mm. and gave you a, a positive view of the future. Can you talk us through that? Yes, I, um, around the time, late teenage years, I had a sort of um, crisis and I actually gave up playing completely. And it was the music of Benjamin Britten that made me miss the cello. I was um, in a library and I, I saw a copy of the solo suites for cello. And I started studying the score and I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing in my head. And I really wanted to pl try playing them. I wanted to explore them. It was number three in particular that, that, that I emotionally related to. Over time, I began to pick up the cello again and worked on that. And it became an obsession, this number three. Even though it's all about death, I felt that this was an opportunity for, for me to, to have a, a rebirth in music. And, um, and that's when I began to start working again. And it really spoke to me, this music. And ever since then, I've always had a fascination for and love of Benjamin Britten's music. And his cello works are extraordinary, thanks to Rostropovich, who inspired them, commissioned them. Um, they're just works of extraordinary genius. And uh, it's really, it's a great honor to be, able to, to be able to play them and to record them and represent them. I knew when I was studying the scores and I saw them and I thought, you know, is this actually possible, some of it physically possible? <laughs> And even if it is physically possible, how do you make it give a great musical line and give it that sense of depth and of, of greatness? And it sure as hell makes you into a better cellist when you have to um, overcome the technical hurdles and then take it one step further when you put in the grammar and then the technique should be a given and then it becomes a great piece of music and then you have to find your own voice in it. So I knew that I had to work hard as a person to become a musician and a, and a fully matured person before I could really put my real stamp on these suites. And the cello symphony, another case, and, and let's say the sonata, wonderful music, I knew that if I could conquer those works, I'd probably end up being a better cellist at the end of it. Now, you also had the spirit of Rostropovich for whom those works were written, mm -hmm. and technically we know he was outstanding. Well, um, I, I find him enormously inspiring, so I always smile to myself when there's always that challenge. You know, and you want that challenge. You want someone to put down a great recording, and you've got to do something different with it. And it's got to be hopefully marvellous, otherwise there's no point doing it. Um, I feel much less intimidated about doing the Britain than I did. I mean, I've recorded a lot of Russian music before this, including Shostakovich and Prokofiev, <laughs> which, is, which does sort of compare you much closely. But I, I obviously have always loved Britain and had a personal connection to him and being British myself. Um, but there is no escaping from the fact that he put his personality onto these works and they were written with Rostropovich in mind. For example, the huge dynamic range that um, Britain actually dictates in the suites, let's say, is, is a portrayal of Rostropovich's own temperament and style. I mean, for, for many years, I didn't listen to his recordings of those works at all, and or anybody's recordings of those works. And I, had my, I went on my own journey, and I found my own way of want, what I wanted to say. And it was only after I'd recorded the suites, I went back to his wonderful recordings of the first two suites. He never recorded number three. And I, and I can see that there must have been a subliminal influence, but I hope that um, I have my own personal connection with Britain and that's come across in my interpretations. Can you help us a little through the suites individually? Mm. Uh, what is the, would you say, the characteristic, the, the wellspring creatively of mm. the first suite? The first suite is a very triumphant, majestic suite, a bit like the last Bach suite in, you know, um, D major. And clearly Bach has been an influence on the suites. I mean, he's called them very archaically a suite, uh, but he was nodding towards Bach and he was also nodding towards Rostropovich's love of Bach and his love of the Bach suites. But it's an extremely triumphant, technically intense, work, which is why I, I think we agreed to film it in, in bathed in morning sunlight and try and get that light in this church. And it creates all sorts of technical hurdles with um, double stopping and drones, and it, it basically um, explores every single technical possibility on the cello. It, it's certainly the most um, for stamina and concentration 
uh, most difficult, I would say. Can you give me an example of a particular technical challenge in the first suite? Yes, I suppose um, there's a movement where you have an open D, and in fact, the entire suite is basically based around this D, this wonderful, you know, in the beginning. Have all this D ringing throughout, all the way through the suite, and in, in this particular movement, you have to hold the D for two whole pages whilst you do the pizzicato. And then you have the bowing. But you've got to hold this D all the way through. And then halfway through that, you then have to get your mute. It's not here, but you put your mute on and you have this other tune. the other strings well and then even through that he requires you to play on the C string as well which you can't do if you're on the D string so you have to then play the D on the G and keep that going whilst you It, without it, it has to sound completely seamless. So for two pages, things like that require enormous control, technical control. But that's one of the most wonderful thing. I mean, these suites really aren't for flirting with. I mean, you, you have to be technically on top of your game to be able to want to attempt them. And that's the beauty of them. I think they're marvellous. Now, you, you say that two is your favourite. Yes. Well, for what reasons? That took a very long time. It's similar to my... Um, intense passion for the music of Fauré, which came much, much later. And that includes his cello sonatas, which I never used to like because I didn't really understand the language. And now they're amongst my favorite sonatas. And number two is the one I approached l last out of the, the three. It was number three, the number one, the number two. And I couldn't understand, I couldn't unlock its secrets. This mysterious language, which begins with actually a quotation of Shostakovich, which is for <laughs> For symphony and they often quoted one another's music because they were very you know mutual friends and it was so um, elusive and it was full of mist it was very slow paced and I it took me a while to understand what its language was and then once I found what that was I began to become fascinated and obsessed with this work and for me it's become almost the deepest for me um, even though number three is overtly so. But it was, it was number two, I, I, I have not been able to stop playing. I absolutely love the second one. It's the one less done, I think, usually. I think for those reasons. It's also extremely difficult to memorize. There's, nothing, there's no pillars for it to rest upon, like a number one with the cantos. You actually have, it sort of runs into five movements, this wonderful long chacon at the end, but it's incredibly te technically difficult, but not in an obvious way. But it's, it's an astonishing work. And actually the chacon from the last, the last movement of number two is almost the masterpiece of the entire set of three. It's, it's gorgeous, absolutely amazing music. So number three. 
Um, yes. For Rostropovich, as one and two, yes. performed but never recorded, is rather bizarre, isn't it? It is, actually. Although, um, I mean, Rostropovich always said he never got round to recording it, he never, um, which I find hard to believe, actually. I think that, uh, because Britain died shortly after, a couple of years after the premiere of Number 3, and it's a deeply personal work, um, and I think Rostropovich found it very upsetting, and it is tragic and passionate, and it is all about death, with these big tolling <laughs> bells at the beginning, and it's a quotation from him for The Departed, it's a Russian contachion, and written for Rostropovich in mind, and he to present it to him in Russia. So it's, it's a very personal language to him, and I think that Rostopovich, I'm not sure whether he performed that regularly after Britain died, so we don't have an interpretation on record of that, but it is uh, just such a passionate, yearnful suite, and I can see why it is so popular. It's also the most playable, but as I said before, it has a language that you have to relate to in order to perform it properly. Again, technically, it struck me as being almost impossible to play. And, you know, <laughs> and watching you do it, it, you know, sort of a, a magical experience. Mm. Show us something that, you, that if you didn't struggle with, at least you had to come to grips with technically, mm. you know, with great facility. Well, um, firstly, I, I need to explain that the, the suite is based on three folk arrangements, folk songs that Tchaikovsky made and the hymn for the departed, and they come right at the end. So they make sense at the end, the suite makes sense at the end, the variations at the beginning. Um, the hymn for the departed is quoted at the beginning. Um, and you've got these beautiful, very simple folk tunes at the end, which you realize have then been interwoven into this incredibly complex suite of movements. And so you have all this double stopping that still quotes the... Um, wonderful um, little folk song and, um, and this motif and whilst that's going you, another voice comes writing this fugue writing which then evolves into two or three voices so it's trying to sustain that and bring out those voices yet be utterly in control of what you're doing and then you go into um, after all these wonderful laments you go into this furiously fast movement which is all under pianissimo and the whole thing has to last about two, 30 seconds even though it's two, two pages long and you've got the <laughs> The challenges are not so much the uh, stamina or the intensity or the technique as such, although you have to obviously have one to perform it, but it's this emotional um, stamina that you need. It, I mean, it, it's so, so powerful. And even that, this last note that he writes, it's C, and you've got to make it last as long as possible. And even that requires enormous control. And you can, you can make it last for a couple of minutes, probably. You just if you keep control of the tension and just release it slowly and 
diminuendo, so we can last quite a long time. We could talk for hours like this. <laughs> but it's all about that control. And it, it's wonderful because it gives you the opportunity to do that. Often it could be seen as contrived if you're trying to show a technique by having this bow control, but it is the end of the three suites and it is the end of that particular one and you want it to fade out and you want to hold the atmosphere live in public. You don't want someone to burst out clapping, so you hold it there for absolutely ages. Magnificent. We're in a very special church now, aren't we? Yes. A very Can cold you... church. <laughs> but welcoming in its style and uh, mm. spirituality to us, and hospitality indeed, uh, for this recording. But can you tell us some, just a little bit about the church in relation to Britain? Mm. Well, I mean, this is, this is down the road from Alborough and Snape, and we knew that he was very fond of it, and concerts were done here. And when I used to come to visit, often, Olber, I have friends in Olber and Snape, and I always used to come to this magnificent church. And every time I came in, I thought, I must do a concert here, I, I must play here. This is just such a welcoming, beautiful, majestic space. And I thought, you know, I think this would be marvellous to film the suites, and I think they need a visual representation. And so uh, that's when I said the seed in my mind that, I, you know, I'm, you know, I must do this, and then lo and behold, here we are. Very risky doing it in December because it's snowing outside, absolutely freezing. But it was a very clear vision as soon as I came in. And it's even though it's a huge space, it's a very beautiful, intimate, warm, welcoming environment, I think. Um, and I think that it's got Britain all over it. When somebody says Benjamin Britain to you, what is the image or sound that comes into your mind? Often um, his wonderful vocal works, um, his choral works, his amazing cello works, obviously, and his violin concerto, which I loved as a child. Um, but mostly it's his extraordinary vocal output. And I see him as an image in my mind as a pretty young man. He has always had that slightly um, smirk, smirk on his face, that smirky smile, which I associate him with. I wish I'd met him. Um, I, I can only do so through my music, but I wish I'd met him in person. But, and of course his operas, you know, his Turn of the Screw is my favourite, and Peter Grimes, and extraordinary orchestration, and his colour, imagination, piquancy in his music. I love it. I've always loved Benjamin Britten, and I'm just so grateful that he, he wrote all these magnificent works for the cello, thanks to Rostropovich. You know that one of our crew here today felt his presence beside him on one of the pews when you were playing. That's amazing. Yes, and actually, you know, if, we, if we're talking esoteric, when I, I'm performing the suites, I have a similar experience. You can feel it. It helps you along. It should do, anyway. <laughs>